Let's break the political talk show mold. Anything worth doing is hard, and that includes being a good citizen. Our mission is to help you be that better citizen by letting you hear about stuff you might not know, which will make everyone think you're so smart, or by giving you a chance to listen to interviews and debates on a wide variety of subjects that might actually allow you to form new opinions in the privacy of your own mind. I'm Justin Oldham, and you are listening to the Politics and Patriotism Show here on the Stitcher Smart Radio Network. Good morning, good evening, wherever you are, and welcome to another historical edition of the Politics and Patriotism Show. In this episode, I'd like to bring you a conversation that I had with retired United States Army combat medic Patrick Tebalt. He's written a memoir detailing his experiences after 20 years as a jump-qualified paratrooper flight medic. You'll hear him talk about his experiences in the 1991 Gulf War known as Operation Desert Storm. He'll also be telling us about his later deployment in 2003 to Afghanistan as part of Operation Enduring Freedom. Part of what you're going to get from Patrick is a history lesson. In his book, he writes quite knowledgeably about about the evolution of combat medical technologies during his 20 years of service. He also provides some very good historical details on the changing nature of helicopter deployments as he witnessed them between Desert Storm and Enduring Freedom. His observations also include the changing nature of personal and military communications. Now, all of this is wrapped up with a frank and honest discussion of the nature of wartime casualties, post-traumatic stress disorder, and what the nature of Gulf War Syndrome really is. I think you're going to be in for a very full and fast episode, so take off the battle rattle and get comfortable. It's time to hear from Patrick Tebolt about his book entitled... My Journey as a Combat Medic, it's published by Osprey Press in 2012. Hello, my name is Patrick T. Bolt. I'm from Indianapolis, Indiana. I grew up as an Army brat. I traveled around the world, lived in the United States, of course. I lived in Europe for 10 years, and I graduated from high school in Seoul, South Korea, on the Army base where my dad was stationed at at the time. Okay, now, I got a chance to be overseas, but my parents were kind enough to do it when I was a baby. We have got all kinds of photo albums stacked up all over the place. We got Japan and the Philippines and everything else, but I'm too young to remember any of it. And I know that having graduated from high school in South Korea, you remember all of it. So tell us what that was like. It was was a cultural experience that you couldn't teach in a classroom because I was exposed to the Korean culture, expanding my horizon and learning how to be a better human being as a result of it. Learning against these stereotypes that people like to affix against people that are different than their own kind. And I you know, we're all different, but basically we're all the same. Oh, I hear you. It makes sense to me. I think the more traveled you are, the more you realize that uh, the more things change, the more they remain the same. And no matter where you are, you know, people are people. And we all have much the same concerns. And so with that in mind, let's talk about what draw, drove you to go into the military. You talk about in your book a dream you had when you were in the 10th grade. Tell us about that dream and the significance of it. I dreamt that I was in a desert combat environment in the middle of a firefight and there was a medic and I dreamed about this medic taking care of some wounded that went down and I was uh, not too knowledgeable about the uh, Middle East situation. I mean, a 10th grader really knows at that age and at that time in the mid 80s about the, the Middle East. But this dream was so graphic that to me it was really a, a divine dream. I think it was an inspired dream to get me to go into the medical field. I knew that I wanted to jump out of an airplane because my father was stationed at Fort Bragg, North Carolina, and I would watch the paratroopers jump all the time. And I've always said that that's just a way to get to work. Like some people take a train or a bus or a bike to get to work. Paratrooper gets to work 
up and get on a plane, but they still got the job to do. And I think that that dream guided me to become an Army medic. You describe basic training, what it was like to join the Army, go to boot camp and do the things that many people most commonly associate with the military experience. But when we think of combat medics, the average American doesn't quite associate paratrooper with combat medic. So tell us what it was like to go to jump school. It's a three-week-long intensive course. It's conducted at Fort Benning, Georgia, home of the Army Infantry. Everywhere you go in jump school, you have to run, or they call it an airborne shuffle. The first week, you learn how to do the basics uh, that a paratrooper would do, practice jumping out of planes, but you just you go on uh, mock uh, you know, stand-up planes, and they hook you up to a wire, and you fly down a cord. You do a lot of running, obviously, every morning. A lot of push-ups, a lot of sit-ups, your typical PT or physical training. You learn how to fall because that's the hardest part of the jump, obviously, is the landing. The, fall, the jumping out of the airplane is actually quite a, quite a rush. The second week in jump school, we do a lot more running. And understand, though, if you fall out of a run, you get kicked out of school. So a lot of it is an intestinal fortitude check. I've always hated running, to be honest, but I wanted to get my wings. So I had to make sure that I didn't flip out of a run. And a lot of it was just a mental check, just to stay in line and just focus. But the second week, we get to jump off these 250-foot towers, or what they're called. And it's uh, they just put us up in the towers, release the chute, and we just slowly fall to the ground with a parachute. And then on that Friday, we do a five-mile run at about an eight-minute pace per mile. And if anybody falls out of the run, they get kicked out of school. The final week of school, be a paratroopers, the actual jumping out of the airplane, you have to jump five times out of different aircraft. I remember my, my first jump, and it was such a daze and such craziness in the airplane. Everything was so loud. And then as soon as we, I jumped out the door, it was just so quiet and serene. And it was beautiful to see the earth from that perspective in the first person. And of course, you know, we jump at around 1,200 feet, so it's not that far from the ground, but enough to enjoy the view a little bit. When we get to the treetop level, we position our body so when we hit the ground, we sort of fall over and tumble so we don't really try not to get hurt too much. Did my fall, I then I laid on the ground for a minute just to make sure I'll, I could wiggle my toes and my feet. Got up, and that was it. I did four more of those at Fort Benning to learn how to jump. I also experienced, I got to jump out of uh, helicopters into the ocean just for fun. I mean, you know, it was training, but that was a lot of fun, jumping in the water. We would jump in, at, we called it Tybee Island Drop Zone, and just the space in the ocean, and we would just, it was psh, splash get the salt water up your nose, get it in your ear and your eyes, and then uh, we would swim a little bit, and the boats would come pick us up. I really, you know, being airborne, you know, it's, it, like I say, it's a way to get to work, but there is a mentality in the military about, I mean, I, I called my dad a leg because he was a non-airborne or a non-airborne person. Of course, I love my dad, don't get me wrong, but that, you know, that was a great experience for me. So, graduated from Fort Benning, Georgia, and I was an airborne medic. Oh, I'm a big bird in the sky. I'm a big bird in the sky. Oh, we'll jump and some will die. Oh, we'll jump and some will die. Off to battle we will go. Off to battle we will go. To live or die, hell I don't know. To live or die. I got assigned to an army unit called the 160th Special Ops Aviation Regiment, and it was an airborne unit. And what they would do is they would fly people around different missions, and they had a small airborne detachment, like a Pathfinder team sort of, that would guide helicopters in, set up landing zones, and search and rescue. And any time you have people walking around on the ground, you got to have a medic. So that's what the medics did. We supported our team, and we worked as medics in the helicopters. So I got a chance to go to a school to become a flight medic, and I got to utilize my skills as a flight medic from time to time in the back of a helicopter, which is quite different from working in an emergency room or at an aid station because I'm a pretty, I've am a always been a big guy working in a small space, and you, you're working in a crunched-up situation. Your back muscles start to ache after a while. I have some small association with Army medics and specifically with flight medics because my dad, having been a helicopter pilot, a warrant officer for, for 20 years, I am I'm legally blind, so I don't get to be a soldier, but having been a military dependent, every time I went to a military hospital, 
the doctors there always asked me, you know, would you mind if we let the medics take a look at you? And you point out in your book in two or three different places that medics are always taking an opportunity to look at everything and everything just so that they can ha have at least seen it one time. So I, in, in my own small way, I've, I've done my part to educate more than a, a few flight medics, and uh, I, I lost track of how many times somebody stuck a flashlight in my face and just said, hey, just look over here. I, I just want to have a look. You know, we have a saying, see, do, and know. You, you know, you'll watch someone do something for the first time. You do it a couple of times, and then you know how to do it. The training in the military, it's not just limited to going to schools. It's ongoing. You know, that's why we, it, it's 24-7, the training. That's why they call it a training schedule, you know, what the, what the soldiers are going to do for a particular day, especially medics, because we, we take care of people, and there's so much to know about people. And learning to be a medic, the, the training at Fort Sam Houston is short, intense, and it prepares you for the basics, but the training doesn't stop at, after school when you get your certification as an Army medic. It continues. I learned through my physician how to suture lines, stick chest tubes, advanced airway innovation skills, stuff that I can do today as a nurse practitioner legally. But as a medic, I mean, I was learning these advanced skills, these advanced life-saving skills that I utilized from time to time. And I've saved lives doing it. And in a way, I feel I have an upper hand because I work as a nurse practitioner. And that's like a a physician's assistant, I feel like I have an upper hand versus my coworkers because of my experience as an Army medic. They can they can never take away that experience. It may not be a, a certification as far as I'm in the civilian world, but I've got that hands-on training, you know, my hands in blood, and my hands taking care of wounded soldiers that I'll never forget. Now, I'm curious about one thing. I live in a military town, and I have known here just uh, through loose association i have known at least four former military medics who have gone on to be nurse practitioners they're all males and they all like what they do very much they're very satisfied with the the, the profession they talk positively about their careers so i'm just curious to know what is it about the army medic as a as a job and then and the nurse practitioner as the job that makes the two so compatible i think the underlying factor is people you, you either as a medic you know you learn to love what you do which is taking care of people not just prescribing pills or doing exams but seeing people to me, you know, minus the education differences between the two jobs, but you're ultimately, you're about people. And I, and I find that that's the, uh, you know, it, as I progressed in the, in my field, my chosen field, I never forget, you know, who it is I'm taking care of. I, I don't take care of a, of a piece of machine. I don't build a furniture. I don't deal with electricity, but in a way I deal with all of that, because if you think about it, the, the nervous system is electric. Our heart is a machine and our bones are like the wood and furniture. So, but ultimately that's a person that you're, you're working on. So it's, it's, you got to have a love of people, first of all. And I think those that do, that really love taking care of people who want to transition into the uh, medical field in the civilian world that decide to, you know, do their time and want to pursue it further, you know, not just nurse practitioners, some become I've known one that's becoming a physician. Some become PAs. Some like working as nurses, and a lot work as paramedics and EMTs. Well, whatever makes them happy, you know. But they're doing what I think is uh, what their divine, you know, intervention made them do. For me, anyway. This program is brought to you by ShadowFusionBooks.com. I think you've really encapsulated that quite well because all four of these people that I know have said very much the same thing. And it's clear to me through in the passages in your book that you're very much oriented towards the people because you spend almost as much time talking about the various people that you dealt with here and there as you talk about yourself. So 
with that in mind, let's give people a larger sense of your career. You did become a paratrooper medic. Tell us about your Gulf War deployment. There's some history there, and once this is uploaded to the internet, it lives forever. So from your perspective, uh, tell us about what it was like to go to the Gulf War. Think about what future generations need to know about that so that 50, 60, 100 years from now when they hear this, that uh, not only do they get this from you, but they're hearing things that they're probably not going to find in an old magazine article. I remember the day, August 2nd, 1990, when Iraq invaded Kuwait. And let's be honest, we like to get our oil, we like to drive our cars so that we get a lot of... The bottom line is an unstable Middle East means that oil doesn't ship out to the world, which people that get frantic and chaotic, I mean, that's just my perspective. So you got to have a stable Middle East. That's why it's so important. And when one country invades another sovereign country, that leads to chaos and just like on Get Smart, you know, chaos isn't good. So I remember the day I was a young 19-year-old whippersnapper, you know, still learning how to become a medic. We find the news that, you know, Saddam Hussein's army invaded Kuwait and realized we're going to probably go to war. So my unit started, to, elements of my unit started deploying overseas to uh, Saudi Arabia, where our, our rear base was at. Um, many of the more seasoned medics deployed first, but I had to stay back because I was still one of the newbies. And I went for some additional training to become an expert field medic, which was done with the 3rd of the 75th Rangers. It was uh, pretty intense physically, mentally, spiritually for that matter, because I learned what my limitations were physically. And I earned my expert field medical badge, which is an award given to medics that compete for this badge. So I upnoshed my training a little bit and became a little bit of a better medic, but I still didn't deploy to the, the Middle East up until December of 1990. I got to say goodbye to my family and took an airplane ride to uh, Saudi Arabia. It was a different culture back then. People have to realize the technology. We still couldn't. Making a phone call from that part of the world to the United States was a big deal because we had to use international lines. There was no internet. There was no instant tweeting or anything like that. So we did a lot of communication through letters, handwritten letters. So I would, you know, handwrite letters to my parents. They were my significant others at the time. And they would, you know, write back every once in a while, mail like a care package, which for me was you know, a little bit of candy and soda. And it was a nice gesture. It was definitely a different era. We still used a lot of the equipment that soldiers used from the Vietnam War. We still used the old M16A1 rifle that many soldiers in Vietnam used. A lot of our field equipment was the same field equipment that my father used when he was with the 25th Infantry in Vietnam. They had the uniforms changed, but you know, a lot of that stuff stayed the same. They issued us this desert pattern uniform that we call chocolate because they look like chocolate chip cookies. So we called them chocolate chip cookie BDUs, basically. They were desert camouflage, and we walked around with that all the time. You know, we didn't have any television to watch, but they did have something called Armed Forces Radio. Every day, one DJ would play this song by The Clash called Rock the Casbah, which was about the Middle East. And it was such a you know, crazy inspirational song that it, it really did you know, motivate us. You know, here we are in the middle of the desert doing our thing, and you know, music inspires people, and it was a source of inspiration. So 1991 came, and uh, the, in January, the air war started. My unit was tasked with doing uh, combat search and rescue missions, picking up pilots that had gotten shot down. Luckily, it was few and far between. We also got tasked with you know, flying different organizations into, at the time, behind enemy lines. 
to do certain things and conduct operations and pick them up and come home. You know, as a medic, we would tag along from time to time in case anybody got hurt. You know, sometimes we would go on missions when we knew that there was some bad stuff happening and people, we were there because people were getting hurt. Now, you had some thoughts about uh, the nature of modern warfare in your book and what it means to be behind the lines. So go ahead and take a few minutes here and flesh that out for us. I believe that the term behind the lines as far as combat, that was the last war that the U.S. fought where there was an actual behind the line. Because in the war in Afghanistan and Iraq, there is no, you know, front line of troops anymore. And anybody that's out outside the get, you know, the wire outside the gate, you're in essentially what they would call the World War One no man's land because you're subject to improvised explosive devices, you're subject to, you know, roadside bombs, suicide bombers and some crazy nut running around with an AK-47. But back then, you know, we still thought in, you know, the World War II mentality of, okay, this is our, our line, this is their line, we're going to cross the line to conduct operations. So that was a big difference. So how do you contrast that with what's gone on in the post-9-11 world? The global war on terror, there isn't a, uh, an, a, a demarcation line, like the Korean War, for example, or the 38th Parallel. That was definitely something different, because when we would go in our choppers past the flock, the front line of troops, technically we were behind the lines. And, you know, in today's service, men and women in all the branches pretty much, in my opinion, go behind the lines when they're out in the cities in Afghanistan and back in Iraq. They're all in harm's way. So that, that was definitely different. The way helicopter operations were performed in Iraq, the way they're performed in Afghanistan, Each has its own flavor, but one of the things I like about the time capsule value of your book is the fact that you have taken such a good snapshot of the way helicopters were used during your time in service. I think that future historians ought to pay attention to that because there's not a lot of material on the market right now that explains that as well as you did. You are listening to another Politics and Patriotism podcast. Find us online through iTunes. It's about, the, you know, the, really the technology and how we communicate with the, the helicopter crew and, the, you know, the people in the rear that are coordinating everything and the soldiers on the ground. Now, those are the three elements. And in the past, you know, when, in, in the first Gulf War, for example, we still had hard time establishing communications from the ground to the helicopter, much less to the rear where everybody was, you know, con- you know coordinating all the operations. And I can tell you when I was on the ground, Desert Storm, and you know, we had a satellite radio we could communicate with the helicopter. The helicopter had frequencies that they could communicate with other people. You know, fast forward almost 20 years, and it's all on computer now. You can digitally read you know, requests for a medical evacuation by typing it on a computer. Okay, so with this historical context in mind, please describe the time you spent in Afghanistan so that we can have that for the total context. Afghanistan was, of course, I'm going to say different. Anytime you went outside the wire, you were in harm's way. Communications, though, which is an, your friend, we had, you know, international cell phones. <laughs> we had international cell phones that we could call in. And I could call headquarters in Kabul if something bad was going on and coordinate for medical evacuation, which was almost instantaneous. Because as I was calling in a medical evacuation, someone in the operations was typing in this request, sending it to the medical you know, higher-ups, and they would fly in a C-130 airplane to come pick up our wounded. So it was instantaneous almost, speed of light. The technology, you know, besides the technology, our, our equipment, medical equipment has evolved. Back in the day, we would have to carry around these really big splints to help stabilize femur fractures. And they were metallic, 
and they would rust, and there was nowhere you could really fit them in a bag, a, a medical bag or a rucksack. The technology has evolved today where these splints are telescopic, so you just open them up and set them up, and they perform the goal of traction with, with a femur fracture to just apply traction to help stop the bleeding and alleviate pain. The technology definitely has evolved in the care of bleeding. You know, back in the day, they issued us the old army field dressing that a soldier would carry. And today's, and that was considered your first aid pack. In today's army, today's soldiers and Marines, they carry this packet with a tourniquet, quick clot, which helps stop bleeding. Not everybody carries that. Field dressings that are magnificent, that work as a field dressing where you can just stop the bleeding. Uh, you can apply heavy pressure to help clot the uh, wound. And if needed, you can turn it into a tourniquet. So the technology, medical technology has evolved. But I will say, ultimately, it's the medic that either knows how to use that equipment or doesn't know how to use that equipment. And that's where it comes in the, the training that a medic does during peacetime. You know, it's a stable environment that's not chaotic. And when you go to war, you're in a chaotic environment, but you're able to perform your job to save lives. The, the mentality about, you know, EMA, emergency medical service as a medic is different than what you would see on the street as far as like a, an ambulance. In, in, in the military confines, worrying about airway and breathing are not as important as stopping bleeding. So the medic's first thought is to control bleeding more than anything. <laughs> And then check the airway, because if you can stop the bleeding, most casualties of war in today's war, deaths come from bleeding, not from airway compromise. So that, in, in many ways, that's been applied to some urban tactical medical units that respond with SWAT teams when there's you know, bad things going on. There's you know, lessons learned from the military that's been applied to the uh, civilian sector. You have got really good historical insights in the course of your book. You also spend a lot of time to very meticulously describe the medical technology that you use, the processes of triage, and the appropriate procedures where necessary. And to that extent, the whole thing is very educational. And with that education in mind, I want to take a quick commercial break here. And when we come back on the other side, I'd like to ask you to get on your soapbox for a few minutes and uh, using the gift of hindsight, share a little bit of your wisdom with our audience. I'm Luke Herbert, and this program is supported by 3FeetRadio.com. Uh, there are moments in your book where you wax philosophical about the duality of life and the role of the warrior healer. And so now that you are transitioned out of the military and you have moved on into civilian life, as you look back on all of that now with the gift of hindsight, uh, what what do you think about the role of the warrior healer now here in the 21st century? I think they need to be more of a warrior and a healer. Uh, more emphasis, I think, should be placed. You have a medic going out with soldiers, but and this is going to sound like I'm playing a numbers game. It's another body that can shoot a weapon and throw suppressive fire to help keep our guys alive. Army medics, I, I wish that in school we learned more about all the different weapon systems that the, the military has. We didn't learn that. I, mean, I learned that throughout the years. But basically, you're a medic, but you're with the infantry, so you, you're going to function as an infantry medic, which means if you have to throw suppressive fire down, you're going to do it. I know that vi that goes against what you hear with the Geneva Convention, but when it's all said and done, these are your soldiers that you have to take care of, and if there's enemy combatants that are, are down, well, yeah, you have to take care of them too, but there's no law against throwing suppressive fire down. And a lot of medics have learned this from the past 10 years of war that we've been at. But you're an asset on the battlefield. If you're going out on patrol with a, a bunch of grunts that have a, a 50 cal mounted or a, or a, a saw, which is a squad automatic weapon, it's like a machine gun, you need to know how to fire those systems accurately and how to respond if they jam up. Because those weapons can save your life and save those soldiers' lives that you're out trying to save to begin with. I want to always emphasize that point. As we go through the chapters in your book, you've emphasized the importance of 
your training and the things that you carry with you and seeing new things, going out of your way to see new things. So again, with hindsight in mind, what were the most remarkable or noteworthy medical advances or military advances that stood out to you during your 20 years of service? The most to me, and it, it was it's so the way that we manage airways has become so easy. Back in the day, a soldier would either put a tube, uh, something called a J tube, which just protects the tongue from going to the back of the throat. But now they have these tubes that protect the airway and go down the stomach, so a soldier can still breathe and not have to worry about when somebody's injured. The stomach contents can aspirate up into the lungs. So this this dual tube, part of it goes into the airway, part of it goes into the esophagus, and it keeps the airway open. That technology, it's called a combi tube. It, it's just an awesome, whoever invented that is a genius. You protect the airway from aspiration from the stomach so a soldier doesn't aspirate and die from pneumonia, and you can provide oxygen to the soldier. The uh, Another quick is the uh, the new tourniquets that our, our soldiers have nowadays. There are these quick, they take five seconds to put on versus the old-fashioned get a stick, get a uh, what we call a do-rag, twist it around and tie it and hope for the best. And at half the time, it breaks anyway. You know, this is um, some solid application that saves lives. Now, I understand when people think of tourniquets that they're going to lose, people assume that they're going to lose limbs. And we, we have learned to just apply a tourniquet to someone who's bleeding initially when there's bad stuff going on because blood is life. It doesn't mean they're going to lose that limb. So the mentality of, I, I call it a mentality, of applying a tourniquet and telling the soldier you're going to lose your, your limb, I'm sorry, that doesn't apply anymore. It's a thought process. Let's stop that bleeding quickly because we're dealing with a hostile environment. Get you back to the rear where it's safe. Then we'll deal with that bleeding in a, you know, let's take another look at it and see how bad it is. That to me just, uh, you know, train of thought when I learned as a medic 20 some years ago versus today. Also, just the technology that the, the command uses to call in, like I say, for the helicopters, airplanes, coordinating all this stuff and the computer wizardry that goes on. And they, you know, the time on target, they get that airplane down there for you to get your um, people shipped out so they can be taken care of by the surgeons at the, at the hospital versus sitting at, on, the, on the ground deteriorating. That's been, that to me is just amazing. You devote one whole chapter at the end of your book to advice that you want to pass on to anybody who is thinking about being a military medic. And I'd like you to encapsulate some of that here. If anybody's listening to this and they're thinking about a career similar to yours, what do they need to know? What should they be thinking about in terms of you know, how, 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 do, how do they test themselves to find out if this is really something that they should want to do or to be doing? I always say that being a good medic means, you number one, common sense. You either have it, you can develop some more of it, or if you don't. But you got to have, to me, the best medic is the one that has common sense. And that means telling somebody no when they're doing something that they don't realize the consequences of. Like, like grubs play football in the middle of the desert, wearing no protection, one of them falls breaks an ankle and they're down and they're not going to, we're not going to get an airplane to come ship someone with a broken leg because it's not, you know, life threatening. So they're going to have to wait three days in misery while we split their leg waiting for a helicopter or in this case, an airplane to come pick them up. So you tell them, no, this is not, you know, this isn't a, a grass field. You're playing tackle football in the desert. Let's stop it. You have to learn how to tell people no. Um, you have to love people all kinds of people, even people that technically are your enemy. Because when it comes down to it, once they surrender, you're no longer fighting, you're obligated to, you know, take care of them. I, I, I say that you have to have love of humanity. And, I, and I, that's where that duality of man, the conflict, I'm a soldier, but I'm a medic. I'm an American, but I'm also, I'm, I belong to a, a core, you know, the, I wear, I, don't, I never wore a red cross, but you, you, you wear that red cross in your heart, whereas if somebody gets hurt or injured and the fighting's over, they're no longer the enemy. They're my patient. And if somebody can't make that distinction, they shouldn't be a medic. That to me is very important. You can learn how to stick a needle in a vein, take a blood pressure, all these technical skills to be taught. But it's in the heart is what's important. At what point did you decide that it was time to write this book? 
I was getting ready to get out of the military. I experienced some pretty fascinating things. That, you know, you're watching someone arterial bleeding, for example, and seeing that you know in the battlefield. You, you read about it in books. I experienced it. I wanted to write down my experience to share. Um, I'm not a you know a top type or anything like that. I was the medic. I wanted to share my experience as a medic for others to get into my point of view. Of course, they're going to picture it differently and understand, okay, this is the guy or the gal that goes out every day with our soldiers and something happens they take care of them and I wanted to put the reader into that point of view and I wanted closure I wrote about dealing with PTSD for closure I, I, that my book it was important because we have so many young men and women coming home today that don't uh, not deal with that closure and for me that closure was writing my book so how can people get a hold of you if they want to know more about you or more about the book I have a website actually that I keep up it's medicstory.com and I go on there and I blog from time to time and I have a YouTube page which is accessed from there and sometimes I put funny stuff on there on my YouTube page sometimes it's medical stuff it's but my website it's medicstory.com and I like videos that I, I like to make videos using footage that I took during the wars and you know it's all none of it grotesque or anything like that it's all pg friendly i guess you could say um and respectful of course you know and uh, my my books on that website too obviously Well, that does it for another very busy episode. So if you like what you heard here today, please feel free to find us online at politicsandpatriotism.com because we have many more author interviews and we feature their book reviews on our Facebook page and on our show blog. Now, you can get all of our past episodes for free by clicking on the RSS feed from our main page or by going to the Apple iTunes store and you can download all of our past episodes from there for free just a few few clicks away. And all of you big time technology aficionados can go to stitcher.com and you can download any of their apps for free because they've got an app for your tablet, an app for your smartphone, an app for your Android device, and at some future point I understand they're going to have an app for your house pet. Now I'm probably joking, but maybe not. So on behalf of everyone here at the show, thank you for your time and have a good day. Wow. <laughs>